Hello, I'm Dr. Ron Charles. Thanks for tuning in today to the program. You know, we've been discussing the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount was not, uh, it was not in reality what Metro Golden Mayor shows you it was, or 20th Century Fox. Uh, that shows you Jesus uh, making his way slowly down the mountainside among a, a crowd of people in Jesus stops to make emphasizing points to a certain person here and there, and people were just all over the place. That's not true. Uh, th this Sermon on the Mount was spoken to six people, Jesus' first six disciples. That was Philip, first called disciple, and Nathaniel, whose name was Bartholomew. Then there was Peter and Andrew, his brother, James and John, the brothers cousins of Jesus. These men had been chosen by Jesus to uh, pick up his mantle uh, once he is gone and left the earth. His disciples that would help him until that time happened, they would travel with him. They would help with the sick, help with the needy, help with those that needed help, provide counseling, provide uh, encouragement for Jesus as his body and his spirit would be drained from ministering all day. And they did a remarkable job during the years of Jesus' ministry here on earth, but they had to be trained. They had to uh, know where Jesus was coming from, what Jesus' philosophy was, what Jesus felt about certain issues, and they needed to not only respect what Jesus taught or respect what he thought and how he lived, but to actually adopt those things as their own so that they could be effective in Jesus's ministry. And the first real teaching that Jesus gave to these six disciples on what to expect when they go out to minister was what we call today the Sermon on the Mount. There's many issues in this Sermon on the Mount. You can, uh, there have been pastors that I know that take an entire year to cover the Sermon on the Mount. Others have taken, uh, have written books three and four and 500 pages long uh, about the Sermon on the Mount. And I don't know if you can ever get to the end of it and cover everything totally. But uh, we've been discussing this. We want to continue to discuss in chapter number six of Matthew, uh, which is uh, uh, one of the, the, the major meat portions of the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm going to lead, uh, read number um, 19, uh, chapter number six, verse 19. Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. This is a direct um, opposite of what these disciples had been taught. Ever since 11 AD, when Serenius came through and the town of Sepporus laid it bare, killed 79,000 people, took 11,000 more as prisoners, sold into slavery. The Pharisees had been preaching various ways to get back at the Romans. And one of the ways they preached is to hide their money. <coughs> Those Romans, they left it up to you to voluntarily give your taxes. You support you, you provide your yearly income, your estimate of your yearly income, and then you would be uh, charged an income tax. And you also would charge a production tax, you would charge a family tax, and various other taxes. Um, but that was based on what the Romans knew that you had or what you knew you made. The Pharisees says that you are God's chosen people. You do not give to the Romans who are demonic, who are of the devil, who are demons themselves, 
money that is God's money, God's chosen money. So hide it. And the Romans, if you didn't come up to the standard to which they felt like that you needed, that you uh, that you should, or even from the year previous, they would go into your house and take it. And they would take what is needed. They would uh, search for money. If money wasn't there, they'd take what they could take to satisfy the tax liability. But the Pharisees taught these people, hide it. Hide your money. Hide it in a hole. Hide it in a cave. Hide it in your ceiling. Hide it someplace so that the Romans can't get it. And keep it away from them because this is not their money. This is yours. And so when you lay up for yourself treasures in your own house, in your own, uh, uh, in your own facility, then God will protect it. And God will not allow anything to happen to it. Well, uh, that was not the case. These people, many times, the Romans broke in and they tore the whole house down until they found where the treasure was located. And Jesus says, don't do that. Don't put all of your eggs into the hide basket. Because it's just money. It's just material goods. And it can be stolen. It can be taken from you. It can be uh, lost. It can be anything can happen to it. But if you lay up yourself treasures in heaven where thieves don't steal it, then you're going to be much better off and much happier. Totally completely contrary to what the Pharisees were teaching and what the religious leaders were teaching at that time. And so Jesus stuck his neck out in this teaching, but it was successful. And then he continued. It says, for where your treasure is, then there will your heart be also. I think this is a principle that many of us perhaps lose today because we have the feeling that we can balance both uh, equally. We can balance where the heart is and where the mind is equally. And so many times, we uh, God is the one that gets left out. We know so many, so many, times that churches and we as missionaries to Egypt, we uh, get these type of letters sometime. The, when a church uh, runs into trouble, into financial difficulties, especially if they are in a building program and they uh, run low on money for concrete, the shingles or whatever, we, we get that letter from the church saying we, we regret to inform you that because of our indebtedness or because of this bill or that bill, we have to cut our missions budget. And so we are uh, cutting our support for you. And so it becomes a, a, uh, quite a challenge to trust that the Lord will give that back to us uh, through another means but it's so often the case that when a church gets into trouble on the material world, that they do cut the ministry budget, especially with missions. I don't feel that that is what God wants to do. I know when we were pastoring, we tied everything. We tied. 10% uh, to foreign missions on every dollar that came into the church. 10% for foreign missions, 10% to domestic missions, 10% to local missions, and then 10% to uh, discretionary fund, which meant that if a missionary came through town, then we could write them a check for three or four or five thousand uh, uh, dollars from that discretionary fund. And so basically we were tithing about 40 percent 
And every time our church got in trouble with finances, uh, money didn't come in, or we needed something for a special project, uh, what I did as I announced to the people, said this week or this month, we are doubling our tithing. And uh, there were some people got kind of upset about it, but God always honored it. And God always not only let us meet that challenge, but also to even uh, straighten up the indebtedness that it caused the challenge to begin with. And so when you uh, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, then the earth will take care of itself. And truly, Jesus knew what he was talking about when he says, where your treasure is, then there your heart's going to be also. And so we need to really, really be careful with what we do with our money and how that is related to what we feel is important spiritually in our heart. And so be very, very careful with that when you, uh, when you challenge God. He continues on. The light of the body is the eye. Now, this is a scripture that I really didn't understand. Uh, and I'll explain to you why. He said, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye is single. Now, the single there is what the King James uh, translators use. But the word that is used means focused. So if your eye is focused, thy whole body will be full of light. But then this is what confused me. But if thy eye be single, single or, or evil, it means aporus. And it's a military term. In fact, Alexander the Great had a uh, aporus regiment. It said, then thy whole body shall be full of darkness or unfocused. So I was looking at that and I said, wait a minute. So, if you're focused on a particular thing, then I understand that then everything else will be uh, uh, in tune and everything else will be aligned. But what does this mean if you're a porous? And I was wondering, said, how in the world, why? Why did Jesus use a military term in this particular teaching to his disciples. Now, an aporus was quite unique, an invention of Alexander. Now, these were uh, bowmen, archers, and uh, they used the bow and arrow, And but on their arrows, what they used to do is cut off the top feather or the top guide that was on the back of the, of the arrows. And um, then the bowmen would uh, shoot three arrows at a time. And this was the Aporus Wedgeman. Now, because you take off that top feather or the top guide and shoot three at a time, then just because you're aiming at a particular individual or a particular uh, area doesn't necessarily mean that those arrows are going to go to the arrow to the place where you're aiming. Because when you let go of those three arrows at once with no guide, then those arrows will shoot just as forcibly as they always have. But there's no guidance. It goes this way, this way, this way. So even though you may be aiming at a soldier right in front of you, when you release it, it may kill someone four or five down or kill another one 12 over. You have no idea where they're going to go. So you're not focused. And, and so what Jesus is telling these disciples, that if you are not focused on what you're doing, if you're not focused on what you're trying to accomplish, then you are a porous. You'll let go of your, of your arrows, of your compliments, of your uh, counsel of your recommendations and 
you may intend it for the person that you're addressing it to, but if you're not focused and you're slipshoddy and you uh, don't have the right perspective, you may be hurting someone else on the other side of the room or hurting someone else that is uh, not even intended to be hurt, but you hurt them just the same. And the enemy was so afraid of the Aporus that when this regiment came into the, uh, the fray, the Friday fray, the enemy would normally leave and just leave that spot in front of them totally blank and undefended because they were so afraid of it because you couldn't tell. With a regular archer, he pulled the arrow, and if you're in front of it, you're dead, or at least wounded. But with the porous, you pull the uh, you pull the bow, and pew, they just go, and have no idea who is going to get hit, who is going to get hurt, and perhaps even those that you are not intending to get hurt or to get hit are the ones that are done. And so what Jesus is saying to his disciples is this. He said, it's not enough to enter into the fight. You must enter into the fight, but you also must enter into the fight knowing what you're doing. Focused on your target. Focused on what you intend to do. Focused on what you want to do. Focus on your enemy. Focus on those that you're helping. Because if you're not, then you're just like an Aporus. You shoot your advice. You shoot your recommendations. And it may hit someone and help them. But most likely, it's going to hit someone that's not intended to get hit. That you didn't want to get hit. And it's going to hurt them and perhaps even mortally wound them. So don't do it. Be focused on what you do, and if you are, then you will be successful. And he says, no man can serve two masters. Either he shall hate the one, love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. Now, the hold to is what is uh, used as what is called a weight. And this same weight was used in Isaiah 40, 31, where it talks about they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. <coughs> and so <clears throat> what Jesus is telling these disciples is that you can't have two masters. Now, for many, many years, people said that God and mammon means God and money. And that, that, that may be true. And, uh, the, but mammon doesn't mean money. Uh, mammon means substitute God. So you have a God and a substitute God. Now, that substitute God could be money. It could be prestige. It could be um, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. It could be... Uh, political office. It could be anything that takes <clears throat> the, the place of God's uh, honor or the place of respect as far as you are concerned. <coughs> Excuse me. And so um, back in Isaiah, when he says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. He was referring to the Assyrian uh, regiment of eagles that was at that time attacking Jerusalem. 186,000 Assyrian soldiers were surrounding Jerusalem, and they had 1,000 war eagles. <clears throat> These war eagles had a, a wingspan of about 8 to 10 feet, and they were just monster eagles that they uh, bred for war. And the Assyrian soldiers used to hold these eagles uh, with a leather strap. And this leather strap was woven uh, like a lady braids her hair. And uh, they call this woven thing a weight. Uh, 
and this uh, weight means that it was woven together. And this weight was, uh, was held by the soldier and they would then allow the eagle to, to begin to, uh, to take flight and they would hold on to this eagle. And it actually, the soldier would be lifted up off the ground and they would just hit the ground about every 20 or 30 feet and they could actually run completely around the walls of Jerusalem, only hitting the ground maybe a dozen times. And they could do it endlessly because they never got tired. They could run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint because that eagle was, was taking all the, uh, 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 all the energy. And, um, uh, and so, but then at a certain time, at, uh, when it was when the commander said to, they would release that weight, and that eagle would pew, go right straight up in the air, and he would get up to his maximum uh, height, and he, filling his lungs with all that oxygen as he went up, and then he would turn and dive at about sixty miles an hour, and go back behind the walls of Jerusalem, and hit people over there behind the walls and knocked their head completely off. There are over 2,000 uh, uh, beheadings by eagles in, during the time of the siege of Jerusalem in the reign of Hezekiah. And so what uh, the example that Isaiah used is that they that wait upon the Lord, he was using this uh, actual uh, event, this actual offensive weapon of the Assyrians to show these um, these people of Israel how they should rely upon God and be weighted together with God as his focal point. So Jesus is saying the same thing. He says, your weight can't be God and mammon because it don't work. It has to be God and God. And if you're tied together with God, if your strength is around in his strength, then that is what's going to be effective. You can't serve God and a substitute God. You can't be weighted together with God and someone that is not God. You have to be weighted together with him and him alone. And if it is with him and him alone, then you will be successful then you will be uh, at the type of position that God honors and he will direct you, he will guide you, and in that way you know that you'll be in his will and his will totally and completely. So don't be weighted together with the cares of the world, but with God only. And he will bless you, and he will honor that commitment from him. Welcome to Canaan, a small indigenous community here on the west coast of Colombia. In recent years, Canaan has grown tremendously. The people here have a heart for God and for sharing His love. This is where the Cubit Foundation does their work. Over the years, Cubit has worked on developing the community in many ways, and by doing so, they've developed personal relationships and bonds that will last a lifetime. Cuando viene un 
cualquier persona eh, del extranjero, pues lo recibimos con mucho amor, recibimos con mucho aprecio, con mucho afecto, porque sabiendo que si esta persona ta, vive tan lejos, no nos conoce y nos viene a visitar, eso para nosotros es muy satisfactorio y, y, y toca mi corazón de una manera especial. Brad Charles is one of the leaders behind Cubit and their work in Canaan, Colombia. His passion is for helping people in need around the world and doing God's work out here on the mission field. Cubit Foundation has done some incredible work here thus far, and God's presence is truly evident. Through partnerships with local Colombian churches, Cubit has taken part in service to the village of Canaan. And with your help, Cubit will continue to serve them and many more around the world. When people give to Cubit, I want them to go. I want them to go with me. And I want them to experience this. Lo imposible para el hombre es posible para Dios. To find out more and to become a part of what Cubit is doing here in Colombia, log on to cubitfoundation.org. That's cubitfoundation.org.